and thank you for joining the National Care to CONUS Foundation and our doctors from the Southern California College Optometry for our series for optometry students on care to CONUS and specialty contact lenses. We've launched this series to celebrate National Care to CONUS Day and expand the education of students who have a special interest in managing care to CONUS. The National Care to CONUS Foundation was founded by families affected by care to CONUS in 1986, and it's the oldest and largest organization dedicated solely to care to CONUS. Since 2016, the foundation has been located in Irvine, California. The miss mission of the foundation is to provide information and advocacy for individuals with care to CONUS by sending free educational materials, answering inquiries, and providing newsletters and webinars. The foundation also hosts roundtable discussions at professional meetings like the American Academy of Optometry and ARVO for researchers and clinicians. Students are always welcome to participate in these events. The foundation launched World Care to CONUS Day five years ago, and it's now celebrated internationally by those who are affected by Care to CONUS. All students who view these lectures and sign up for the National Care to CONUS Foundation newsletter in November will receive a gift from the National Care to CONUS Foundation. I'm Erin Roof, Chief of the Cornea and Contact Lens Services at SCCO, and I will be the moderator. Throughout this series, our SCCO doctors will discuss various topics related to Care to CONUS, um, diagnosis, management, and contact lens fitting. The cornea and contact lens faculty at SCCO are all residency trained experts in fitting irregular corneas and managing anterior segment disease of all kinds. On top of patient care, our faculty teach SCCO students in all things cornea and contact lenses and are involved in research and education for optometry students, residents, and clinicians at all levels. I'm proud to introduce our faculty doctors who are uniquely qualified to talk to you about these topics. For this lecture, Drs. Annie Chang and Don Lamb will be talking to you about corneal GP um, fitting for keratoconus. Dr. Don Lamb received her degree in optometry from the Southern California Col College of Optometry and also completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Houston College of Optometry. She, along with Dr. Chang, heads our cornea and contact lens teaching curriculum at SCCO. Dr. Annie Chang received her optometry degree from the UC Berkeley School of Optometry and completed her residency in cornea and contact lenses at SCCO. She's currently the residency coordinator for our cornea and contact lens residency program. So if you're interested in that program, feel free to contact her. So without further ado, I will let Drs. Chang and Lam talk to you about corneal GP fitting. Hi everyone, hope everyone is doing well. I'm Dr. Lam and uh, my co-presenter today is Dr. Amy Chang. Today we're gonna present on corneal GP lenses for keratoconus patients. Neither Dr. Chang nor I have any conflicts related to the topic in this lecture. We're both contact lens educators, so we do um, certainly have some workshops that we have been uh, participants of. Um, Dr. Chang and I see specialty contact lens patients with our interns and residents in Anaheim, California. And collectively, we fit patients with corneal, sclerals, and hybrid lenses. Uh, for those of you who are listening, if you know you are interested in the residency program or you know someone who is, I would highly recommend it. For today's topic, we will be discussing the management considerations for corneal GP keratoconus patients. We've, we have brought with us some of our patient cases and we'll utilize videos to highlight some troubleshooting tips. The goal for today is to understand corneal GP lens design and how it affects fit and how it can affect, affect our patient's comfort. The benefits of corneal GP lenses is quite clear. Um, due to the um, size of the lens and the way the lens sits on the eye, it does provide, it does allow for us to um, provide good ocular health for our patients. It does have the lowest rate of incidence of microbial keratitis. And because of the lens movement on the eye, it does allow for excellent tear exchange and the ability to provide oxygen um, to our patient's corneas who, who in these types of patients tend to have more delicate ocular surfaces. Um, the rigid nature of the corneal GP lens provides excellent visual quality. The size of the contact lens um, promotes good lens handling and ease of lens care. 
And oftentimes our patients may be under financial limitations where the cost of these lenses are a good option for them. Now, clinically, when I'm seeing patients, I oftentimes will divide patient cases into the following categories, mild, moderate, and severe. But do keep in mind that there are multiple factors which define keratoconus, and our patients don't necessarily fit, don't necessarily always fit into these nice, neat bins or categories. We do need to keep in mind that changes in disease severity will dictate our lens management decisions, and we're going to be utilizing these categories to help guide our lecture today. Now, wherever you may be listening to this lecture, you may have your favorite um, keratoconus fitting set that you use or uh, one that you have had experience with. Um, but regardless of what, what fitting set that you're using, uh, there will come a, there are proprietary and non-proprietary lens designs. You may be familiar with the Rose K2 or the Metrocone or the Quetzet, um, but regardless, we're going to be, um, you should always try to look at the cost, the customizability of the parameters, and any special features that the lens can provide for you. In today's lecture, we um, will be utilizing the um, examples from the CLEC fitting set. Um, and regardless of which um, keratoconus fitting set that you are familiar with, um, you will notice that in each set, you should be able to, you, you will be able to adjust both the central parameters and the peripheral parameters separate from each other. And in this lecture, uh, before we continue, I'd like to have everyone on the same page so that we will be talking about the central curvatures um, the base curve, the contact lens power, the OED and OZD separately from the peripheral fitting curve. In the CLEC set, the primary peripheral fitting curve is the secondary curve radius and the secondary curve width. You will notice that we will highlight um, this particular curve whenever we're referring to peripheral clearance. Uh, you may be familiar with these peripheral curves in other fitting sets in terms of steps, or letters or numbers to denote change. In this particular presentation today, we will utilize millimeters of curvature for the secondary curve radius to, to denote um, changes in the radius of curvature. Now, regardless of whatever fitting set that you're using, there will come a moment in time where you'll need to read a fluorescein pattern. And when reading fluorescein pattern for a keratoconus patient, um, we're looking for a, we're looking for that classic three-point touch. And what you see in the video here is that there's um, touch at the three o'clock position, the central position, and the nine o'clock position. And that's what doctors refer to when they refer to three points of touch. The key is that the area of uh, bearing centrally is just, is very feathery and just kisses the central apex of the cone. The reason I bring this up is because there is a range of base curve which can yield three-point touch. And if we contrast that with the video on the right, we can see that although there is three points of touch, the central area of touch in the second video is much more harsh and bears more uh, flat on the patient's eye and is not what we would deem to be ideal. So in this lecture, you're going to be looking for three points of feathery touch, just like the video on the left. I now um, would like to turn this over to Dr. Che, who's going to start us off with our first case. Okay, as, um, as Dr. Lam had mentioned, the way we fit keratoconus patients changes as you move along the spectrum of the condition. And we'll start off by talking about mild keratoconus and illustrate some things to consider um, when you encounter this group of uh, keratoconus patients. So this, uh, we'll utilize this case here and it's a 27-year-old male and his chief complaint is blurred vision at all distances for the past year. And he's complains particularly about halos around lights at night. Um, his past ocular history is unremarkable. In fact, he has no history of spectacle wear. Um, his past medical history is also unremarkable. 
Now, if you look at his um, unaided acuities, it's no wonder that the patient didn't have a history of spectacle wear. He sees very well out of the right eye. If you look at his manifest refraction, um, there is anisometropia, and the left eye has moderate amounts of astigmatism. At the time of the visit, the attending doctor um, gave a tentative diagnosis of refractive anisometropic amblyopia due to the um, reduced vision in the left eye. Now, what is unusual about this level of anisometropia is that it's not typically associated with this level of amblyopia. Now, if you're thinking about keratoconus, um, this is also an unusual refraction for keratoconus because in keratoconus patients, um, you typically will see myopic refractions. But yes, both keratoconus and amblyopia may cause difficult endpoints on refraction and reduced acuity through spectacles. Now, the, um, on slit lamp exam, the cornea was clear. So the clear corneas do not help us differentiate the difference between keratoconus and amblyopia. But if you're thinking about keratoconus um, for a patient in your chair, you will want to look for slit lamp signs that can confirm your diagnosis. The slit lamp signs that you're looking for are vertical striae, which are stretch marks um, along the stroma. You, you're also looking for Fleischer's ring, which is iron deposition lines at the base of the cone. And Fleischer's ring can be appreciated in both white and blue light. Now, our patient returned one week later for a dilated exam, and at the dilated exam, the results were unremarkable, so the attending doctor ordered a corneal topography to rule out keratoconus. Now, this is the corneal topography map of the right and the left eye, and I'd like to highlight a couple things here. The first thing that probably jumps out is that you can see right away there's a localized area of steepening um, in both the right and the left eye. And for the left eye, you can understand why there's um, a reduced acuity. It's due to this corneal steepening. Now I'd like to talk about the right eye. The right eye has a little bit of irregularity, but um, the irregularity is not along the visual axis, and so that explains why the patient is still able to see well out of the right eye. But if the keratoconus progresses in that eye, it's likely to impede on the patient's vision. Now, the question here is, do you fit a, a contact lens on the right eye? It's, I, I think we would all agree the left eye, because of the reduced acuity, the patient would benefit from a rigid lens. But what about the right eye? Now, for this particular case, um, we elected to fit a corneal GP lens on the right eye as well. The reason being is that it can stabilize the patient's vision during the day, and it can provide a better quality of vision. Now, if you're going to start off fitting corneal GPs on mild keratoconus patients or any keratoconus patient, you'll need a diagnostic contact lens fitting set. If you don't have one specific for keratoconus and you have a mild uh, cone in your chair, you can actually use one that you um, would utilize for fitting normal corneas. The starting or the initial base curve that you should select should be based on the steep K values, but really, um, Really, the biggest decision um, the biggest decision you'll you'll do will be to read the fluorescing pattern. So just get a lens on. Now you have to have a strategy um, when determining the final base curve, and the strategy that we utilize is a bracketing strategy. We're looking for that flattest lens that just barely clears the apex of the cone. And that lens will give you that ni nice feathery three-point touch. So let's take a look at uh, the fluorescing pattern for the patient um, we have. And this is the patient's right eye here. And you'll notice here um, there's this nice feathery um, touch in the center. Um, and you'll notice that if there's anything about this fluorescing pattern, um, the peripheral clearance is minimum. I would like to, if I can adjust the one thing about this fluorescing pattern, it would be to increase the tear exchange. 
Now, looking at the parameters of this lens, you'll notice that these parameters are not much different than ones um, that you would fit on a normal cornea. Now, since I uh, wanted to adjust the peripheral, uh, peripheral clearance for this uh, fluorescing pattern, what I did was I adjusted the secondary curve. Um, keep in mind that the secondary curve radius is what controls our peripheral clearance um, for, our particular, uh, for our particular lens design. Um, for proprietary lenses, you're looking at the peripheral curves. But just flattening the peripheral uh, clearance or secondary curve, you'll notice you'll get a better tear exchange and you still have that nice feathery um, three-point touch. Now, some of you may, may observe the fluorescing pattern and ask, um, is there excessive movement of this lens? And you don't really get excessive movement if you have optimized the lens to cornea relationship. So in this case, um, the movement of this lens is good. Um, it facilitates good tear exchange. So the tip here for patients with mild keratoconus is to utilize a flatter peripheral curve relative to the base curve when compared to normal corneas. All right, so let's now move on to our next case, which is a patient with moderate keratoconus. Um, with increasing disease severity can come different contact lens challenges. Um, and the reason is the central cornea becomes steeper and steeper as the disease progresses, but the peripheral cornea remains um, more of a normal corneal curvature. So some of the common contact lens challenges are base curve adjustments and optical zone considerations. Let's take a look at our next case. Our next case is a 30-year-old female who has a history of um, keratoconus. She was diagnosed uh, just under 10 years ago, and she reports to her annual comprehensive exam with symptoms of uncomfortable lens, a foreign body sensation, and she reports that it's constant in duration, and she doesn't uh, obtain relief unless she removes the lens. She reports that the symptoms started about a month ago, and she um, is here for our annual exam to see what we can do to help her. Now, whenever I think of patients who report lens discomfort, I always think about lens adaptation, which isn't likely the case as she is a habitual uh, corneal GP lens wearer. Another cause for lens discomfort would be a poor lens edge, also not likely an issue because she has been wearing the lens successfully for the past 11 months. However, she may have, um, she may have gained a chip, a small chip, at the edge of the lens, which we can, we can evaluate for when we look at the lens fit. What's most likely the cause of her lens discomfort is the lens to cornea relationship. And we will pay attention to that when we look at the fluorescein pattern. She does have backup glasses, um, and you'll notice that her backup glasses, she doesn't see as well um, through them as she will in her contact lenses, but her backup glasses are important in cases of emergencies or evacuations. She does see better through her glasses than she does through nothing at all. You also notice with the topography image that her keratoconus is positioned inferior centrally, um, and this will become important when we look at the fit of the one. So let's take a look at the fluorescein pattern. With this fluorescein pattern, you can see um, that there is three points of touch. Um, there's adequate amount of peripheral clearance. The lens does appear to be positioned inferiorly due to the location of the cone. What's more concerning is, uh, you, is that you may notice that there's a, in her central cornea that there's central, uh, central corneal staining, and this is likely the cause of her lens discomfort. Now, when we look at the fit of this lens, the strategy here would be to steepen the base curve of the lens to help one, alleviate the harsh bearing that's noted centrally, and also to alleviate that central corneal staining. If you do not already have a strategy for steepening the base curve of the lens, uh, one method would be to continue to, steepen, continue to steepen the base curve of the lens in each subsequent 
order until you reach that final lens that just grazes over the central area of the cone. Looking at the final um, fluorescein pattern, we ended up steepening the lens a total of two and a half diopters, um, and it took us two to three lens changes to achieve this final contact lens. And it's not unusual in patients who are wearing a lens that's excessively flat that we may need to make two or three lens changes to reach that final endpoint. You'll notice that in this fluorescein pattern, we still have the three-point touch, but the uh, central area is a feathery um, area of touch over the central cone. The lens still positions inferior, inferior centrally, and that won't change because her, if you recall from her corneal topography image, um, the area of steepening is located slightly inferior centrally, and the lens will always center over the steepest portion of the eye. The patient, after the, after the first um, lens order, reported a significant improvement in lens comfort. And you can hopefully now see that we have, um, we have alleviated that central staining that was present on our corneal surface. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, um, wouldn't it be easier or is it a possible alternative to fit the patient into a scleral lens instead of making the changes to the corneal GP? And I would say it is a possibility, it is a possible, a plausible option and in treatment management to change the patient into a scleral contact lens. A scleral contact lens will vault over the central cornea and we can avoid all issues of central corneal staining. But I will caution you that when you do switch a patient from one lens modality, such as a corneal GP lens, to a scleral lens, you may be trading in one set of problems for another. This case is meant to highlight that making a simple base curve change um, alleviated both the patient's lens discomfort and her central corneal staining. The other contact lens challenge that I'd like to discuss is optical zone consideration. Um, and before we talk, before we look at a couple of examples, I, I'd like to take a look at a sample um, contact lens fitting parameters. If we look at sample contact lens fitting parameters in any keratoconus fitting set, you should notice that there are a wide range of um, base curve curvatures. And with increasing disease severity, of course, we will be reaching for those base curves that are on the steeper end of the fitting set. With that, uh, you will notice that high minus powers tend to be um, associated with patients with increasing disease severity, as well as smaller overall diameters and optical zones. And that's very classic of most keratoconus fitting sets. Um, this particular one that you're looking at is from the Quex fitting set, and we tend to use that more in our clinic because it does help our interns and our residents understand the lens parameter changes. Let's take a look at our next example video. So in this particular um, patient, this patient is wearing a lens that has a, that this patient is wearing a lens with an optical zone too small for their eye. And so you'll recall in the previous slide that with increasing disease severity, oftentimes you'll find that the OZ, that the base curves are steeper and the optical zone diameter becomes smaller. For this particular patient though, um, we do have to balance the diameter of the optical zone with their disease severity. This particular patient, you'll notice um, the pupil is looking just through the junction of the optical zone and the secondary curve radius, and they're reporting glare and halos um, when viewing through the lens in the evening. For this particular patient, to alleviate these symptoms, we would need to increase the optical zone to give the patient more lens to look through. And in this lens fit, you'll notice that the lens is uh, positioned superiorly and by increasing the optical zone and overall diameter, we will also secondarily make the lens a little bit heavier and potentially better center um, this lens position. However, we always need to balance 
the changes in optical zone to the um, central corneal curvatures. So if we look at the next video, this particular patient is wearing a lens with an optical zone too large for this particular eye. Um, when we look at the fluorescein pattern, we can see that there's central area of bearing that seems relatively harsh. Um, and superior to that, there appears to be a central area of pooling that's so great that there's now a large bubble trap within the optical zone. The lens, you'll also notice, has no, um, does, not, does not have any peripheral clearance and does not, is not showing any tear exchange. And this lens has now suctioned onto the patient's corneas. We look at this fluorescein pattern and we might ask ourselves, should we steepen the central base curve of the lens to alleviate the central area of touch? Or should we flatten the central base curve of the lens to help uh, reduce that large air pocket um, in the superior central region? And the answer to that actually is neither. Um, let's turn our attention to um, a pictograph. So if we, if we focus on the image that's on the right, that represents the, our previous fluorescein pattern. And you can see that when a keratoconus patient is wearing a lens that's larger than necessary for their eye, uh, we end up with a large area of space between the back surface of the lens and the peripheral corneal surface. What we really need to do for patients with very steep central corneas is to reduce the optical zone diameter around the base of the cone. And that's what's depicted in the image on the left. By shrinking the optical zone around the base of the cone, we've now reduced the excessive space that's um, between the back surface of the lens and the corneal surface. And now we can focus on necessary base curve changes to optimize that central relationship. So the tip from this, um, from these, these examples is that with increasing disease severity, uh, we would expect uh, steeper base curves and smaller optical zones. However, given that um, our patients may vary in may have varying pupil size diameters, we do need to balance the patient's habitual pupil diameter to the contact lens optical zone diameter. I now turn the, turn the case back over to Dr. Chang, who will round us off with our last patient case. Okay, so um, this last case on severe keratoconus, um, I think is a fun one. Um, it's a 30 year, it's of a 30 year old male and his chief complaint is intermittent fluctuating vision at all distances with his lenses. And it occurs after several hours of wear while on the computer. Um, his previous ocular history is keratoconus and he was diagnosed at the age of 19. So he's well aware of his keratoconus status. Um, he's, his contact lens history, he's wearing a front surface torque corneal GP lens for the past nine years. So a few things about the case history here. Um, one thing is that if a patient is complaining about intermittent fluctuating vision, um, it can possibly due to emerging presbyopia given the patient's age or maybe the patient has uncorrected refractive error and if that's the case you will need to do your foropter testing to rule those um, those diagnoses out secondly um, if the um, intermittent fluctuating vision occurs after several hours of wear while on the computer that could possibly be due to dry eye, and of course, you'll want to um, rule that out with your dry eye tests. Um, the other comment I'd like to make about the case history here is that the patient's wearing a front surface toric corneal GP lens. Now, front surface torics have gained a lot of popularity um, in the past uh, couple years due to um, scleral lenses. Front surface torics, whether it be scleral lenses or corneal GPs, require a stabilizing mechanism. In scleral lenses, it's typically, um, the stabilizing mechanism is typically the, a, a uh, toric haptic that um, takes advantage of the toric sclera. Now with corneal GPs, the stabilizing mechanism is a prism. 
And when you incorporate prism into corneal GP lenses, it can af negatively affect the fit of the lens. So I would caution um, you guys to utilize a front surface toric corneal GP lens. But this patient has been wearing it for the past nine years. Now, this is the corneal topography maps of the right and the left eye. And you could see, um, particularly in the right eye, he does have uh, severe keratoconus. Now, this is the fit of his fluorescing pattern. And, you know, if, if I had to give a trophy for a patient of mine that had the most bubbles underneath a lens, I would give that trophy to this patient. You'll notice just this amount of uh, impressive amount of bubbles underneath um, the, the, the lens. Now, these bubbles, um, if you look closely here, these bubbles are the singular um, bubbles that um, Dr. Lamb had mentioned before. This looks more like soda pop fizz. And if you remove the lens, um, it almost looks like his cornea looks a little bit like a golf ball. This is actually dimple veiling. And um, this is certainly a significant amount of dimple veiling. Now, when you see dimple veiling, um, it's usually indi an indication that there's too much space between the lens and the cornea. So what you want to do when looking at the fluorescing pattern is to evaluate for pockets of space. Um, if we look here, the, underneath, the, um, underneath the optic zone, you could see that there's this feathery touch there. So there's, the lens, we know the base curve of that lens is not excessively steep. Um, secondly, the optic zone size. The optic zone size is 6.7. So we know that we can't go much smaller than that. Otherwise, the patient may experience glare when the pupils dilate at night. Now, thirdly, if you look at the fluorescing pattern, the other area and pocket of space is actually um, this area in the peripheral currents. This, the, peripheral, um, the peripheral curve width here is very quite large. And so it seems like the bubbles are getting tra uh, trapped under the large peripheral uh, curve width and creating the bubbles um, that are forming underneath the entire lens. Now, what can we do? Well, what you can, what you'll want to do when you see dimple veiling is try to eliminate the pockets of space. You can, um, you can consider the use of a piggyback and jamming a soft lens underneath there to kind of fill up the space. Um, I would caution you to utilize piggybacks as the first option um, because piggybacks um, entail the patient purchasing another uh, set of lenses. It requires sometimes more a different solution. Um, it complicates the patient's uh, life and it can foster poor compliance. So. Um, it's not my number one uh, solution for this particular case. Now, what I wanted to do when you look at this next fluorescing pattern, what you wanted, what I wanted to do was I wanted to reduce the optic zone size as much as possible. Um, secondly, I wanted to optimize the, the lens to cornea relationship. I steepened it just a little bit in light of the change in the optic zone. But the major change of this fluorescing pattern is changing the peripheral curve width. I narrowed the peripheral curve width, um, and in doing so, it eliminated a lot of the bubbles that were entrapped. Yes, you can see, you can certainly see a little bit of dimple veiling still on the cornea here through the lens, but that dimple veiling is not along the visual axis, and so the patient didn't complain about the blurred vision. Um, after several hours of lens wear. Um, the other comment I'd like to make is I changed the design of this lens from a front surface torque to a sphere lens. Um, just with, a, uh, with this change, the patient was able to still see well. Um, and with certainly with both eyes open, he didn't even notice um, a reduction in his vision. So we uh, for simplicity's sake, we've changed uh, the lens design as well. So the tip here is that dimple veiling causes intermittent blur, and it occurs due to excessive space between the lens and the cornea. And in, 
order to eliminate dimple veiling, you want to reduce um, the space either by flattening the base curve, um, reducing the optic zone diameter, or reducing the peripheral curve width. And finally, um, the majority of keratoconus patients do well with spherical GP lenses, despite the high refractive astigmatism, and they do provide good vision for our keratoconus patients. So as you can see here from the cases that we've presented, um, corneal GPs are beneficial for um, mild, moderate, and severe keratoconus patients. We'd like to thank the National Keratoconus Foundation for allowing us to present um, on this topic. Thanks, um, Drs. Lam and Chang. That was really great. Um, one question I have for you is, um, how do you how do you address comfort in these patients or help them adapt, um, sort of optimally adapt to comfort um, in in your GP lenses, corneal GP lenses? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think that the one hesitation that uh, practitioners um, would have in fitting corneal GP lenses would be the initial discomfort. Um, I, we know from literature, um, there's a couple things that the practitioners can do. One is during the diagnostic um, contact lens fitting, utilize preparacane. Um, I would utilize preparacane during the initial fit. And it's been shown that um, just doing that um, has helped the patient adapt to the lenses better. And secondly, um, practitioners, when they present corneal GP lenses, if they can present it in a uh, positive, um, competent manner, that also goes a long way in helping the patient adapt. But um, really, I see corneal GP lenses as another tool in my toolbox. I don't primarily just fit one lens or one type of lens. Um, corneal GP lenses are a great option and the best option for some patients. And, um, and, and so, you know, overcoming that um, initial adaptation is just a small challenge, but they will be able to reap the benefits um, for many years beyond that. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks for a, a good lecture and thanks for listening for everyone who is tuning in and we'll see you at the next lecture.